we have a really nice continuity clinic uh, in our dermatology residency in South Florida, and so that's where some of these cases come from. So, Doc, what's this bump on my head? That's this case. It's actually a longtime patient of mine who's 68 years old, and he presented to um, our ambulatory clinic with a slowly enlarging mass that he had had over the past five months. And he noticed it happened a couple weeks after hitting his head uh, while crawling into a crawl space in his attic. No initial treatment. And he was actually in the office for his routine full body skin examination, having a prior history of non-melanoma skin cancer. I was seeing Bill about every six months. On um, physical examination, as you can see, there's a, a five centimeter kind of fluctuant mass which was present in the midline aspect of the scalp. And you know, I kind of thought that this was a hematoma. And you can see it's pretty raised, just trying to get a little bit more of a close up there. And um, you know, what I did is um, I, I aspirated this thing, you know, these midline lesions sometimes get a little scared. I would always trust dermatologic history. And if you can see, if you look at the syringe, I was able to aspirate a fair amount of heme. Some of it was a little bit congealed. congealed. I, I did send this out for PATH because I used a pretty large boron needle. And my histopathology showed hemangioma with organizing hemorrhage consistent with the hematoma. Okay, well, I saw Bill back about two weeks later, and you can see it looks a lot better, but it's kind of flattened down. It was really pancake-like, and it's still pretty large, and I just wasn't really happy with that. It was kind of bothering me, so I ordered an MRI. So the MRI, and I'll summarize this, is a solid mass in the midline of the frontal parietal region that demonstrates an epicenter in the skull and extends to the soft tissues as well as having a cavity uh, intracranially. And also, uh, the impression you can see, he's the uh, radiologist sees a soft tissue mass, um, same thing, uh, a neoplastic process cannot necessarily need, um, be excluded, and, and it says that the lesion would be amenable to percutaneous biopsy. Now, was I gonna do a biopsy at this point? I don't think so. So I called one of my local um, plastic surgery colleagues who saw the patient and actually took him to the operating room. And ironically, he called me from the OR and said, Brad, this lesion, it's stuck to the calivaria. And actually, I see a, a little hole there. So he took what he could, and um, this is uh, kind of the gross appearance of the lesion. And I'll show you the microscopic evaluation. It's kind of a close-up, and what's unique here is you can see that this is a spindle cell tumor. And if you look, there is um, a pretty classical staghorn vessel. So it's a spindle cell tumor. There's pleomorphism. Uh, there's a lot of extravasated erythrocytes, kind of like what I was seeing clinically even when I did aspiration biopsy. If you look closely, there's a lot of mitotic figures, at least five here. I can tell you there's way more than them. So um, I kind of went over the histopathology, but because of this high mitotic rate and the nuclear pleomorphism we were seeing, and that these tumor cells stained with utilizing immunohistochemistry for STAT6, uh, and negative for others like vimentin, although sometimes this particular tumor can stain positive vimentin, uh, but negative for pan uh, cytokeratin and for MART and for some of the uh, other melanoma and spindle cell type tumor stains, the diagnosis of a hemangioperiocyte was made. So we consulted neurosurgery to evaluate the tumor, additional MRI was performed, and it turns out if you put everything together, this lesion was actually growing because it got bigger, um, because the plastic surgeon really debulked a lot of the tumor. So neurosurgery performed a bifrontal craniotomy and then an overlying graft. The patient actually did very well. Um, pathology did confirm the tumor as a STAT 6E positive malignant perios hemangioperiocytoma, which is also known as a solid fiber solid fibrous tumor, uh, World Health Association class two to three. And we'll talk about what that means in a minute. Uh, Post-operative radiation therapy would all, was also uh, completed and with uh, recommendations as the patient was also seen in consult with oncology. So hemangioperiocytomas and solid fibrous tumors represent about 1% of all uh, angiogenic tumors. Uh, they most commonly occur on the lower extremities in the trunk, followed by the head and neck. There's only been a handful uh, that are transcalvarial meningeal derived, like in our cases, very small number found in the literature. And although the etiology of HPCs is unknown, numerous factors have been associated with the development of hemangioperiocytomas, including trauma, like in our case, the use of chronic systemic steroids and uh, individuals who have a variety of different 
different, and the chronopathies. Now, not that long ago, the World Health Organization reclassified hemangioperiocytomas, and our, I believe our, our uh, dermatopathologists classify them now as sol solitary fibrous tumors, and they're kind of one entity now. Uh, grade one is classified as a spindle cell tumor with low cellularity, so not like our case, but grade two corresponds to a spindle cell tumor with more cellularity, less collagen thickening, and stag horn vessels, like we saw in our case. Grade three is classified as a spindle cell lesion with the presence of five or more mitotic figures, like in our case. So can they occur in any group, uh, you know, usually most commonly in the fifth to, to uh, sixth decade? There is an entity also known as an infantile hemangioperiocytoma, which in, tumor, which in children is the most common uh, presentation. And, and there is a more positive prognosis in those children, and actually they can just simply undergo irradiation unless the tumors are large, in which case the combination of surgery and radiation is obligatory. And adult hemangioperiocytomas have a, guard, a guarded prognosis. I went over the histopathology. Uh, clearly, the presence of the multiple mitotic figures in the cellular atypia, some necrosis, I didn't describe that previously, but there was some necrosis in this particular tumor. And the combination of those findings in the immunohistochemistry are really are suggestive of the presence of a hemangioperiocytoma. I just want to point out a very nice study that was done by T Botero and colleagues, which really kind of cinched the most important uh, immunohistochemical stain uh, done in collaboration with gene expression profiling being the STAT6E. So while they're generally benign with a good prognosis, there are cases of malignant hemangioperiocytomas or solid fibrous tumors, uh, like in our case. And, and again, surgery and radiation therapy is uh, obligatory. And in our case, certainly presented uh, that kind of presentation. This was our publication, which was published in the JAD. Case number two, this is EB. This is one of our patients from our continuity clinic who, who told us, and coming into our clinic not looking very well, uh, they told me I have PG. So this un unfortunate woman was uh, homeless and uh, had worsening pain and a multitude of chronic wounds, as you'll see in a couple of moments. She has this questionable history of, she said I have PG, and she was treated with Dapsone and steroids in the past. Kind of all we knew, we didn't really have any records. Um, she did complain of profound fatigue, denied fever, cough, joint uh, pains um, or abdominal pain, uh, no shortness of breath, nausea or diarrhea. Her past medical history was questionable for pyoderma gangrenosum. Uh, Dapsone steroids were used. Uh, she was unfortunately a crack cocaine uh, user, abuser, a smoker, um, denied other IV drug abuse, um, unfortunately was homeless and that's the rest of her history. Uh, this were her initial labs, so she had leukocytosis, or pretty profoundly anemic, an elevated reticulocyte count, her MCV was low at 82, uh, her methemoglobin level was in the limits of, of normal. Uh, she had some uh, thrombocytosis at baseline. I can tell you that her platelet count actually ended up plummeting because we had to admit her to the hospital. These are some of her clinical photos. You can see these ulcerative lesions in a variety of areas. Um, you can see that there were pustular areas, some that are actually still active, but mostly erosive at the periphery of this inflammatory ulceration. And it's pretty uncommon to see pyoderma gangrenosum on the face, although you'll see in a couple moments there are a number of reported cases in the literature. Just some other areas of involvement, the, the gluteal area, and all across her back. You know, we entertain the possibility, uh, perhaps, even if she really does have pyoderma gang gangrenosum, which we believe she does, is that she may have been a skin popper. Of course, you know, skin popping can be the cause here, but also just even pathogy as well uh, can be the issue. So the working diagnosis is indeed pyoderma gangrenosum, and we had to admit this patient to the hospital, and she had a really protracted hospital course. Um, she ended up with septic shock, MRSA. Uh, because of the, the facial lesions, uh, she had preorbital cellulitis, very high white counts, um, really a significant shift with eosinophilia. So our continu continuity clinic uh, recommendations in conjunction with our attending faculty was that of pulse steroids, which we did for five days, and then transi transitioned the patient to prednisone at one milligram per kilogram per day, uh, silver zolpidiazine to the wounds, and low-dose minocycline for its anti-inflammatory and uh, wound healing properties. She refused a skin biopsy, and I believe uh, she had refused skin biopsies before. So we're really treating these patients sometimes clinically. So this is before on the left and then after. You can see the significant contracture of these uh, ulcers and they're improving. It can, even the smaller ulcer that's on the left flank region is much improved. 
Um, again, some of before and afters, really a nice, remarkable response to therapy. You can see also uh, that she had a baseline on her left jaw region uh, by the chin, an older lesion, likely of pyoderma gangrenosa, and you would see the profound cribiform scarring that we see in these patients. And this is what I referenced before, um, uh, small numbers of cases of uh, particularly involving the face, and I actually had another uh, case in my uh, career, and, and these, these cases where there are lesions on the face are challenging because it's hard to differentiate this from either a typical pyoderma gangrenosum or sometimes even Wegener's granulomatosis. So my third and final case, this is BW. This is a 66-year-old male with a one-year history of a bumpy, red, itchy rash beginning on his bilateral forms. Actually, you'll see in the clinical photos, really, uh, on his olecranon processes bilaterally. It was worsening over the month before we saw him in the office. He tried a number of corticosteroids topically over time, calamine lotion, denied headache, fever, abdominal pain, um, uh, any uh, unexplained weight loss or loose stooling. This is past medical history, which was significant for hypertension, atrial fibrillation, peptic ulcer disease. So it was on a number of uh, medications, as you see here, including ACE inhibitor, proton pump inhibitor, beta blocker, Xeralto, uh, and uh, allopurinol. Um, had uh, cardiovascular ablation in the class, was a social drinker, really no other specific contributory medical history. So here are some of the cutaneous lesions, which I would describe as discrete and coalescent. Papules, some of them are papule vesicles. You can't really see them here, but as you see in some of the other pictures, um, again, discrete and mostly coalescent um, papules, somewhat coalescing into plaques, as you see on the left, left thigh. Almost looks like a holster sign like you might see in dermatomyositis, but nevertheless, most of the lesions are discrete, and, and uh, these were mostly vesicles that were excoriated from the patient's significant scratching, also some truncal lesions. So from a very low power, you can see this punch biopsy, which demonstrates a superficial and somewhat mid um, perivascular and lymphocytic dermatitis, but on closer evaluation, you can see these clusters of neutrophils. Some of them are perivascular, but they're mostly clustered into the dermal papillae, um, so we see these, you know, dense clusters of neutrophils. There were some scattered eosinophils. And, and uh, on the next sli slide, you can see this kind of, you know, acantholytic uh, keratinocytes, which we'll also see uh, in this condition. So our diagnosis was that of dermatitis or pediformis, which we usually diagnose utilizing direct immunofluorescence, but our histopath actually came from another clinician uh, in the community. So. Uh, two weeks uh, into evaluating this patient, he, he reported worsening of his lesions, um, CBC chemistries, uh, uh, G6PD levels within the limits of normal. Uh, we did check gliadin IgG and tissue transglutamase IgA and IgG total, uh, which were all, all elevated. The, um, tissue transglutamase IgG was negative, as was the endomycial IgA antibody. We initiated treatment with DAPSON 100 milligrams once daily, topical clobetasone because of the significant pruritus hydroxyzine uh, once daily. Significant improvement. This is a photograph just about one month after therapy, so he turned around very quickly. You can still see residual lesions on the right greater than left olecranon process. Um, so dermatitis herpetiformis, just for educational purpose, about 11 per 100,000. You see the mean age there. There is an HLA correlation with DQ2 and also HLA DQ8, which is the most common. About 90% of these individuals have a gluten sense of enteropathy, which is why it's important to have all of them on a gluten-free diet. Symmetrical group polymorphic lesions, as seen in our patients, consisting of erythema, somewhat urticarial plaques, and even papule vesicles. Uh, the routine histology I, I more or less reviewed, and we typically will do perilesional um, direct immunofluorescence, uh, lesional and uh, perilesional direct immunofluorescence, but a lot of times there are some false negativities, and, and so there's been some studies done looking at uh, evaluating not just tissue transglutamase and endomycial antibodies, but also epithelial uh, versions of the uh, transglutamase antibody. And so this was a nice little study that evaluated uh, 220 patients with DH, and they evaluated the use of that particular serology and found it quite helpful, and so it was helpful in our case as well. 
So we utilize dapsone in uh, patients with dermatitis epidermis. We check for G six PD deficiency. Uh, the gluten uh, free diet is obviously very important. And just as a general comment, the IgA deposits that we see don't necessarily change with the treatment with uh, dapsone. And I just wanted to conclude with what we typically utilize in doing our own biopsies in the clinic, and that's utilizing immunofluorescence. And you see the constellation of possibilities of direct immunofluorescence findings, where at the top we see uh, linear IgA deposits, the most common, which you see on the right, which is in the dermal papillae, and you can e even see uh, fibrillar IgA in terms of positivity of direct immunofluorescence. So with that, my 15 minutes of fame are up, and you got three nice cases.